Polls Chapter 7. The shuffle felt heavy in Stanley's soft, fleshy hands. He tried to jam it into the earth, but the blade ba- banged against the ground and bounced back off with making, without making a dent. The vibrations ran up the shaft of the shovel and into Stanley's wrist, making his bones rattle. It was dark. The only light came from the moon and the stars, more stars than Stanley had ever seen before. It seemed he had only just gotten to sleep when Mr. Fandansky came in and woke everyone up. Using all of his might, he brought the shovel back down into the dry lake bed. The force stung his hands and made him made no impression on the earth. He wondered if he had a defective shovel. He glanced at Zero, about 15 feet away, who scooped a shovel full of dirt and dumped it into a pile that was already almost a foot tall. For breakfast, they had served some kind of lukewarm cereal. The best part was the orange juice. They each got a, a pint carton. The cereal actually didn't taste too bad, but it did. It had a smell. Just it smelled just like it's caught. Then they filled their canteen, got their shovels, and were marched across the lake. Each group was assigned a different area. The shovels were kept in the shed near the showers. They all looked the same to Stanley, although X-Ray had his own special shovel, which no one else was allowed to use. X-Ray claimed it was shorter than the others. But if it was, it was only by a fraction of an inch. The shovels were five feet long from the tip to the steel blade at the end of the wooden wooden shaft. Stanley's hole would have to be as deep as the shovel, and he'd have to be able to lay the shovel flat across the bottom in any direction. That was why X-Ray wanted the shortest shovel. The lake was full of holes and mounds that it reminded Stanley of the picture that he had seen of the moon. If you find anything interesting or unusual, Mr. Pandansky had told him, you should report it to either me or Mrs. Sir when we come around with the water truck. If the warden like what, she, what they found, you'll get the rest of the day off. What are we supposed to be looking for? Stanley asked him. You're not looking for anything. You're digging to build character. It's just if you find anything, the warden would like to know about it. He glanced helplessly at his shovel. It wasn't effective. He was defective. He noticed a thin crack in the ground. He placed the point of the shovel on top of it. Then he jumped back on the blade of the the blade with both feet. He sank the, the shovel sank a few inches into the packed earth. He smiled. For once in his life, it paid to be overweight. He leaned on the shaft and pried up with his first shovel full of dirt, then dumped it off to the side. Only 10 million more to go, he thought. Then he placed a shovel on the back and jumped on it again. He unearthed several shovelfuls of dirt in this manner before it occurred to him that he was dumping dirt within his perimeter of his hole. He laid a shovel flat on the ground and marked the edges of where his hole would be. Five feet was awfully wide. He moved his dirt he'd already dug up out past his mark. He took a drink from his canteen Five feet would be awfully deep, too. The digging got easier after a while. The ground was the hardest at the surface, where the sun had baked the crust about eight inches deep. Beneath that, the earth was looser. But by the time Stanley broke past the the crust, a blister had formed in the middle of his right thumb, and it hurt to hold his shovel. Stanley's great-great-grandfather was named Elia Yelnats. He was born in Latvia. When he was 15 years old, he fell in love with Myer, Myra Menke. He didn't know he was Stanley's great-great-grandfather. Myra Menke was 14. She would turn 15 in two months, at which time her father had decided she would be married. Elia went to her father to ask for her hand, but so did Igor, Igor Barka, the pig farmer. Igor was 57 years old. He had a red nose and fat, puffy cheeks. I will trade you my fattest pig for your daughter, Igor offered. And what have you got? Myra's father asked Elia. A heart full of love, said Elia. I'd rather have a fat pig, said Myra's father. Desperate, Elia went to see Madame Zeroni, an old Egyptian woman who lived in the edge of of town. He had become friends with her, though she was quite a bit older than him. 
She was even older than Idgar Barkov. The other boys of the village liked to mud wrestle. Elio preferred visiting Madame Zeroni and listening to her many stories. Madame Zeroni had dark skin and a very wide mouth. When she looked at you, her eyes seemed to expand and you felt like she was looking right through you. Elio, what is wrong? She asked. Before he even told her he was upset, she was sitting in a homemade wheelchair. She had no left foot. Her leg stopped at her ankle. I am in love with my Raminki, Elia confessed. But Igor Barkov has offered to trade his fattest pig for her. I can't compete with that. Good, said Madame Gazzaroni. You're too young to get married. You've got your whole life ahead of you. But I love Myra. Myra's head is as empty as a flower pot. But she's beautiful. So is a flower pot. Can she push a plow? Can she milk a goat? No, she's too delicate. Can she have an intelligent conversation? No, she's silly and foolish. Will she take care of you when you're sick? No, she's spoiled and will only want you to take care of her. So is she beautiful? So what? <laughs> Madame Zeroni spat on the dirt. She told Elia that she, he should go to America, like my son. That's where your future lies, not with my Raminki. But Elia would, El, Elia would hear none of that. He was 15 and all he could see was Myra's shallow beauty. Madame Zeroni hated that, hated to see Elia so forlorn. Against her better judgment, she agreed to help him. It just so happens my son gave birth to a litter of piglets yesterday. My soul gave birth to a litter of piglets yesterday, she said. There's one little runt and she won't suckle. You may have him. He would die anyway. Madame Zeroni led Elia around the back of her house where she kept her pigs. Elia took a tiny piglet, but he didn't see what good it would do for him. It wasn't much bigger than a rat. He'll grow, Madame Zeroni assured him. Do you see that mountain in the edge of the forest? Yes, said Elia. On top of that mountain is a stream where the water runs uphill. You must carry the piglet every day to the top of the mountain and let it drink from the stream. As it drinks, you are to sing to him. She taught Elia a very special song to sing to the pig. On the day of Myra's 15th birthday, you should, should carry the pig up the mountain for the last time, then take it directly to Myra's father. It would be fatter than Igor's pigs. If, that, if it is that big and fat, if, uh, if it is that big and fat, asked Elia, how will I be able to carry it up the mountain? The piglet is not too hairy for you now, is it? Asked Madame Zeroni. Of course not, said Elia. Do you think it will be heavy for you tomorrow? No. Every day you car will carry the pig up the mountain. It will get a little bigger, but it you will get a little stronger. After you give the pig to Myra's father, I want you to do one more thing for me. Anything, said Elia. I want you to carry me up the mountain. I want to drink from the stream and I want you to sing the song to me. Elia promised he would. Madame Zeroni warned, if he failed to do this, he and his descendants would be doomed for all of eternity. At the time, Elia thought nothing of the curse. He was just a 15 year old kid and eternity didn't seem much longer than a week from Tuesday. Besides, he liked Madame Zeroni and he would be glad to carry her up the mountain. He would have done it right then and there, but he wasn't strong enough. Stanley was still digging. His hole was about three feet deep, but only in the center. It slopped upward to the edges. The sun had only co just come up over the horizon, but he had already could feel its hot rays against his face. As he reached down to pick up his canteen, he felt a sudden rush of dizziness and put his hands on, the knees, on his knees to steady himself. For a moment, he was, eight, he was afraid he would throw up, but the moment passed. He drank the last drop, last drop of water from his canteen. He had blisters on every one of his fingers and one of, in the center of each palm. Everyone else's hole was a lot deeper than his. He couldn't actually see their, their holes, but he could tell by the size of their dirt piles. He saw a cloud of dust moving across the wasteland and noticed that the other boys had stopped digging and were watching it too. The dirt cloud moved closer. 
and he could see that it trailed behind a red pickup truck. The truck stopped near where they were digging, and the boys lined up behind it. X-ray in front, zero at the rear. Stanley got in line behind zero. Mr. Surfy filled each of their canteens from a tank of water in the bed of the pickup truck. As he took Stanley's canteen from him, he said, This isn't the Girl Scouts, is it? Stanley raised and lowered his one shoulder. Mr. Sir followed Stanley back to his hole to see how he was doing. You better get with it, he said, or else you're going to be out here digging in the hottest part of the day. He popped some sunflower seeds into his mouth. Deathly removed the shells from his teeth and spat them into Stanley's hole. Every day, Elia carried the, pig, the little piglet up the mountain and sang to, his, sang to it as it drank from the stream. As the pig grew fatter, Elia grew stronger. On the day of Myra's 15th birthday, Elia's pig weighed over 50 stones. Madame Zeroni had told him to carry the pig up the mountain on that day as well. But Elia didn't want to present himself to Myra smelling like a pig. Instead, he took a bath. It was the second bath in less than a week. Then he led the pig to Myra. Igor Barkov was with his pig as well. These are the two of the finest pigs I've ever seen, Myra's father declared. He was also impressed with Elia, who seemed to have grown bigger and stronger in the last two months. I used to think you were a good-for-nothing book reader, he said. But I see now you could be an excellent mud wrestler. May I marry your daughter? Elia boldly asked. First, I must read the pigs. Alas, poor Elia should have carried his pig up the mountain one last time. The two pigs weighed exactly the same. Stanley's blisters had ripped open, and a new blister formed. He kept changing his grip on his shovel to try to avoid the pain. Finally, he removed his cap and held it between his shaft of his shovel and his raw hands. This helped, but digging was harder because the cap would slip and slide. The sun beat down on his unprotected head and neck. Though he tried to convince himself otherwise, he had been aware for a while that his piles of dirt were too close to his hole. The piles were outside of his five-foot circle. But he could see that he was, do he was going to run out of room. Still, he pretended otherwise and kept adding more dirt to the piles, piles that he would eventually have to move. The problem was that the dirt was in the ground, that the dirt in the ground was compacted. It expanded when it was excavated. The piles were a lot bigger in his hole then his hole was deep. It was either now or later. Reluctantly, he climbed up the, out of his hole and once again dug his shovel into the previously dug dirt. Myra's father got down on his hands and knees and closely examined each pig, tail to snout. Those are two of the finest pigs I've ever seen, he said at last. How am I to decide? I only have one daughter. Why not Mar let Myra decide, suggested Elia. That's preposterous, Igor explained saliva as he spoke. Myra is just the empty-headed girl, said his father, her father. How can she possibly decide when I, her father, can't? She knows how she feels in her heart, said Elia. Myra's father rubbed his chin. Then he laughed and said, <laughs> why not? He slapped Elia on the back. It doesn't matter to me, a pig is a pig. He summoned his daughter. Elia blushed when Myra entered the room. Good afternoon, he said. She looked at him. You're Elia, right? She asked. Myra said her father. Elia and Igor have each offered a pig for your hand in marriage. It doesn't matter to me, a pig is a pig. So I will let you make the choice. Whom do you wish to marry? <laughs> Myra looked confused. You want me to decide? That's right, my blossom, said her father. Gee, I don't know, said Myra. Which pig weighs more? They both weigh the same, said her father. Golly, said Myra. I guess I choose Elia. No, Igor. No, Elia. No, Igor. Oh, I know. I'll think of a number between one and ten. I'll marry whoever guesses the closest number. Okay, I'm ready. 10, guessed Igor. 
Elia said nothing. Elia, said Myra, what number did you guess? Elia didn't pick a number. Mary Iger, he muttered. You can keep my pig as a wedding present. The next time the water truck came up, it was driven by Mr. Pandansky, who also brought a sack, who brought sack, um, sack lunches. Stanley sat at his back with his back against a pile of dirt and ate. He had a bologna sandwich, potato chips, and a large chocolate chip cookie. How you doing? asked Magnet. Not real good, said Stanley. Well, the first hole, the hardest, Magnet said. Stanley took a long, deep breath. He couldn't afford a dwaddle. He was a, he couldn't afford to dwaddle. He was way behind the others and the sun just kept getting hotter. It wasn't even noon yet, but he didn't know if he had the strength to stand up. He thought about quitting. He wondered what they would do to him. What, uh, what they would do to him. What could they do to him? His clothes were soaked with sweat. In school, they learned that sweating was good for you. It was nature's way of keeping you cool. So why was he so hot? Using the shovel for support, he managed to get to his feet. Where are we, where are we supposed to go to the bathroom? Asked Mag, he asked Magnet. Magnet gestured his arms to the great expanse of around him. Pick a hole, any hole, he said. Stanley staggered across the lake, almost falling over the dirt pile. Behind him, he heard Magnet say, but first make sure there's nothing living in it. After leaving Myra's house, Elliot wandered aimlessly through the town until he found himself down by the wharf. He sat on the edge of the pier and stared at the cold black water. He could not understand how Myra had trouble deciding between him and Igor. He thought he loved, she loved him. Even if she didn't love him, couldn't she see that what a foul person Igor was? It was like Madame Zeroni had said. Her head was as empty as a flower pot. Some men were gathering on, on another dock. And when he went to see what was going on, a sign read, Deckhands wanted free passage to America. He had no sailing experience, but the ship's captain signed him aboard. The captain could see that Elie was a man of great strength. Not everybody could carry a full grown pig up the side of the mountain. It wasn't until the ship had cleared the harbor and he was heading across the Atlantic that he suddenly remembered his promise to carry Madame Zeroni up the mountain. He felt terrible. He wasn't afraid of the curse. He thought that was nonsense. He felt bad because he knew Madame Zeroni wanted to drink from the stream before she died. Zero was the smallest kid in Group D, but he was the first one to finished digging. You're finished? Stanley asked him enviously. Zero said nothing. Stanley walked to Zero's hole and watched him measure it with his shovel. The top of his hole was a perfect circle and the sides were smooth and steep. Not one dirt clod more than necessary had been removed from the earth. Zero pulled himself off the surface. He didn't even smile. He looked down his perfectly dug hole, spat in it, and turned and headed back to camp, to the campground. Zero's one weird dude, said Zigzag. Stanley would have laughed, but he didn't have the strength. Zigzag had to be the weirdest dude Stanley had ever seen. He had a long skinny neck and a big brown head with wild, frizzy blonde hair that stuck out in all directions. He said his head seemed to bob up and down on his neck like it was a spring. Armpit was the second one to finish digging. He also spat in his hole before heading back to the campground, the camp compound. One by one, Stanley watched even each one of the boys spit into his hole and return to the camp compound. Stanley kept digging. His hole was almost up to his shoulders, although it was hard to tell exactly where the ground level was because his dirt pile was completely surrounded by, completely surrounded the hole. The deeper he got, the harder it was to raise the dirt up out of his hole. Once again, he realized he was going to have to move the dirt piles. His cap was stained with blood from his hands. He felt like he was digging his own grave. In America, Elia learned to speak English. 
He fell in love with a woman named Sarah Miller. She could push a plow, milk a goat, and most important thing for herself. She and Elliot often stayed up half, half the night talking and laughing together. Their life was not easy. Elliot worked hard, but he had bad luck, but bad luck seemed to follow him everywhere. He always seemed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He remembered Madame Zeroni telling him that she had a son in America. Elia was forever looking for him. He'd walk up to the complete strangers and ask if she, he, they knew someone named Zeroni or had ever heard of anyone named Zeroni. No one did. Elia wasn't sure what he'd do if he found Madame Zeroni's son anyway. Carry him up a mountain and sing the pig lullaby to him? After his barn was struck by lightning for the third time, he told Sarah about his broken promise to Madame Zeroni. I'm the worst pig thief, he said. You should, have, you should leave me and find someone who isn't cursed. I'm not leaving you, said Sarah, but I want you to do one thing for me. Anything, said Elia. Sarah smiled. Sing the pig lullaby. He sang it for her. Her eyes sparkled. That's so pretty. What does it mean? Elia tried his best to translate from Latvian to English, but it wasn't the same. It rhymes in Latvian, he told her. I could tell, said Sarah. A year later, the child was born. Sarah named him Stanley because she noticed that Stanley was Yelnats spelled backward. Sarah changed the words of the pig lullaby so, if it, so that it rhymed and everything, every night she sang it to little Stanley. If only, if only the woodpecker sighs, the bark of the tree was as soft as the skies. While the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, crying to the moon, if only, if only. Stanley's hole was as deep as his shovel, but not as quite as wide enough at the bottom. He grimaced as he sliced off a chunk of dirt, then raised it up and flung it into a, onto a pile. He laid his shovel back in the, down into the bottom of his hole, and to his surprise, it left. He rotated it and only had to chip a few chunks off the dirt here and there. Before he could lie flat across his hole in every direction, um, before it could lie flat across this hole in every direction, he heard the water truck approaching and felt a strange sense of pride at being able to show Mrs. Sir or Mr. Pandansky that he had hold. Um, that he had dug his first hole. He put his hands on his rim and tried to pull it up himself, himself up. He couldn't do it. His arms and back were too weak to lift his heavy body. He used his legs to help, but he just didn't have any strength. He was trapped in his hole. It was almost funny, but it wasn't in the mood. He wasn't in the mood to laugh. Stanley, he heard Mr. Pandancy call using his shovel. He dug two footholds in the whole, whole wall. He climbed out to see Mr. Pandansky walking over to him. I was afraid you fainted, Mr. Pandansky told him. You wouldn't have been the first. I'm finished, Stanley said, putting his blood spotted cap back on his head. All right, said Mr. Pandansky, raising his hand for a high five, but Stanley ignored it. He didn't have the strength. Mr. Pandansky lowered his hand and looked back down at Stanley's hole. Well done, he said. You want to ride back? Stanley shook his head. I'll walk. Mr. Pandancy climbed back into the truck without filling Stanley's canteen. Stanley waited for him to drive away, then took another look at his hole. He knew it was nothing to be proud of, but he felt proud nonetheless. He sucked up his cap, his black, he sucked up his last bit of saliva and spat. Chapter eight. A lot of people don't believe in curses. A lot of people don't believe in yellow spotted lizards either, either, but if one bites you, it doesn't make a difference whether you believe it or not. Actually, it's kind of odd that scientists named the lizard after its yellow spot. Each lizard has exactly 11 yellow spots, but the spots are hard to see on this yellow, yellow green body. The lizard is from six to 10 inches long and has a big red eyes. In truth, the eyes are yellow, and it's skin, and it is the skin around the eyes which are red. But 
everyone always speaks of his red eyes. It also has black teeth and a milky white tongue. Looking at one, you would have thought, excuse me, that it should have been named a red-eyed lizard or a black tooth lizard or perhaps a white tongue lizard. If you've ever been close enough to see the yellow spots, you're probably dead. The yellow spotted lizards live, like to live in holes, which offer shade from the sun and protection from the predatory birds. Up to 20 lizards may live in one hole. They have strong, powerful legs and can leap out of, a very, out of very deep holes to attack their prey. They eat small animals, insects, certain cactus thorns, and the shells of sunflower seeds.